Man, grab your Bibles. Grab your Bibles. This is a little pop quiz here real quick. Make sure you still got your line. He is risen. Okay, okay, okay. But here's the deal. Don't tell that to Bertrand Russell, all right? So Bertrand Russell was probably the most famous atheist of the 20th century. Right? He was a British mathematician. He taught at Oxford. He was a smart guy, sharp dude, um, famous, an old guy, and he hated any idea, any notion of God. And so one of my favorite authors tells a story about him uh, in the 90th year of his life at a party there in England back in the day. He was there, and he was there with all the socialites and everything, and a lady looks at him and says, Dr. Russell, you are, without a doubt, the most famous atheist in the entire world. You actually might be the oldest atheist in the entire world. So I've got, I've got a question. I've just got a simple question for you. What are you going to say? What are you going to do if when you die, you're wrong and there is a God? And Dr. Bertrand Russell, one of the greatest minds of the planet at the time, says, then I'll point my finger at him and I'll say, you, sir, gave us insufficient evidence. Oh, look. I don't want to be me on Judgment Day, okay? But I don't really want to be Bertrand Russell on Judgment Day at all, right? Well, unfortunately for Dr. Russell, he has all the evidence he needs. He has all the proof that he needs now. But unfortunately, it's too late, right? But if we can just be honest, if we just be honest, Russell's thoughts, it does, it does stir a few questions, right? It, it does force us to kind of ask ourselves some 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 quiet, maybe even completely private questions inside of our own soul. Because, because here's the deal. Everything hinges on Easter. Listen, if Jesus is dead and his bones are still rotting in some cave in the Middle East, who cares? Let's have a good night. Let's go eat some barbecue and sleep in tomorrow, all right? But if he is alive, if he is alive, Philip Yancey actually says one of my fav other favorite authors, Philip Yancey goes, if he's alive, that makes Jesus dangerous because I can't I can't ignore that kind of guy I can't look a guy in the eye who came back to life and go I don't really care what you said I don't really care what you think I don't really care what you call me to do because that's how important Easter is and, and so we go do I really believe this story do I really believe that a dead guy came back to life on his own power do I have any good reasons to believe this story? Or is it just a story? If you've ever asked yourself that question, I want you to know you're not alone. There was an entire church 2,000 years ago who was wondering the same thing. They called themselves the church at Corinth. Now, here's the deal. We're going to be in 1 Corinthians 15 tonight if you want to grab your Bibles and flip there or scroll there. Um, they had already had the Apostle Paul visit with them. He'd already come, he'd already preached, he already talked about the gospel, which clearly includes the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the death, burial, and resurrection. That's the apex, that's the pinnacle, that's the hinge pin, the linchpin that, that, that everything about Christianity rises and falls on, right? Um, and so Paul has taught them, but they got some questions. There's some false teachers there brewing and kicking around some erroneous ideas. And so they just got some questions about this whole resurrection thing, about how the dead guy came back to life and all that it means. And so they did the best thing they could. They asked the smartest person they could, the Apostle Paul. And he sent them back in a letter the following answer. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Uh, I'm going to read verses 1 through 8. It'll be on the screen if you don't have your own copy of God's Word. But this is what the Apostle Paul said about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He says, now I would remind you, brothers and sisters, I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, and then to the twelve, and then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. And then he appeared to James, and then to all the apostles, and last of all, as to one 
untimely born, he also appeared to me. I love how Paul says, let's just get right down to it. That which I got from Jesus, I passed on to you of first importance. This is the resurrection. It's at the top of the food chain of everything that we believe, right? Because if this weekend is erroneous, if we're mistaken, and Paul goes on to say on the next column of the same chapter, he goes, if Jesus is dead, then Christians are people to be pitied above all others. We have believed a lie. But because Jesus is alive, he goes, that's the first importance. There's a lot of important things that we cling to in the Christian faith. But Paul says, the resurrection of Jesus is the first importance. Let me just just heap on some significance here by comparing that to some other important things. Is Is baptism important? Absolutely, baptism is important. But you got some people who are baptized this way, and some people who are baptized that way, and then you got some people who are baptized in the church, and you got some people who are baptized, you know, in a creek or in a swimming pool or in the Jordan River. Uh, so, so you got all these different ways of getting baptized. So is this a make or break part of the faith? No, the resurrection is. How about your translation of the Bible? Oh, my goodness, let's just meddle here just for a second, okay? Oh, let's just offend somebody, all right? Because you got people who are reading NLT. You got people who are reading the New King James Version and growing in their faith. You got the ESV. You got the CV. You got all these Vs out there, right? Is that a make or break? No, because it's all God's word. It's all true. But the resurrection, Paul says, it's make or break. This is a matter of first importance. And so the question remains is, Are there any good reasons to believe that the resurrection is true? Are there any really good reasons? Because everything's kind of playing on this card. Are there really good reasons to believe that the resurrection is true? Paul's like, yes. In fact, by my count, what I just read to you, exactly 554. Now, some of y'all are going like, this is going to be a long sermon. Okay? But let's just get into it. Let's just hash back through our hearts what the Apostle Paul just said to us. I'm going to share one of them really quickly here with you. The resurrection, here's the best reason I got. The resurrection is grounded in Scripture. This is the first thing that Paul says. I think it's the best thing he says. Argue with me after the service, okay? I think that when Paul goes, listen, the resurrection is grounded in Scripture because he says, according to the Scriptures, according to the Scriptures, according to the Scriptures, what I received from Jesus, I passed on to you, and it was there in the Old Testament all along. I don't know if you know this. But, but there's hundreds of prophecies about Jesus from Genesis to Malachi. Before Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John come on the scene and talk about this guy, Jesus, who was born in a manger, and he grew up, and he, teached and he, and he, he taught, and he preached, and he healed, and he performed miracles. Before any of that, there was, there was I don't know, Genesis chapter 3, about 4,000 years before Jesus. Read Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Okay, and then Malachi, he's about 400 years before Jesus. And then you got Isaiah. Um, Carl, you said tonight that about 700 years, by my math, is almost like almost between 800 years uh, before Jesus. There's this prophet Isaiah running around hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years before Jesus was born. And I want to take you to that passage that we actually talked about a little bit last week. I could bounce around. We could go from Genesis literally to the end of the Old Testament. Let me just show you that what the Apostle Paul said about Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection according to the Scriptures can not only be found all across the pages of the Old Testament, it actually can be found inside of one chapter, inside of just one section of one chapter. Watch watch this. Paul says that Jesus um, was, was, he died, for our sins in accordance with Scripture, there verses 3 and 4, right? Look at, look at what Isaiah chapter 53 has to say right here. It says, He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. With his wounds we were healed like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent. So he opened not his mouth, and by oppression and judgment he was taken away. Guys, that's Jesus, right? That's Jesus. All the oppression, the suffering, the piercing, the the beating, all of these wounds, the whipping that Carl read about just at the beginning of the service, all of those things, Paul says, they were foretold. They were foretold in the Old Testament. Jesus died for our sins. Jesus didn't die, he says. Jesus died for our sins in accordance with Scripture. 
Don't miss that part. Jesus was beaten. Jesus was pierced. Jesus was abused. We were forgiven. We were healed. We were saved. You got that? But then look at this. He says that he was buried in accordance with Scripture. Like, I, come on, like, like, is there a dress code for this funeral? Like, why does the Apostle Paul talk about the importance of Jesus being buried? Why? Well, because if you look down in that same chapter, Isaiah 53, you see this line right here. And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death. Now, in case you don't know this, Jesus was, you know, crucified there on a cross in the middle between two thieves, two convicts, two, two very guilty men. Jesus was not guilty, of course. He was not a sinner at all, and these two men were. And, and you know the story. They came along and they broke the legs of those other two men, but did they break Jesus' legs? No. And we talked about that last week, right? Because Jesus was already dead. The beating that he endured was so tremendous, so awful, he didn't even make it as long as the other two guys did. So, those Roman soldiers, when they were taking the bodies of those dead three men down off the, the cross, they would have just thrown them in this communal grave. There was just this area there, sorry to be so graphic, that they would just take these worthless bodies. I mean, if you were crucified, there were other ways to put somebody to death, but if you were crucified, you were the lowest of the low. You were a scumbag of civilization, okay? So they would take your dead body off and just throw it into this mass grave. Were just unmarked, unnamed, because nobody wanted your body. Nobody, nobody claimed to be your friend, because if they did, they, you might get on the next cross coming out of Jerusalem, okay? So nobody claimed those bodies, but that's not what happened to Jesus, though, is it? In fact, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all four guys who wrote about the life and the ministry, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, mention Jesus's burial. The Bible says in all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that a dude named Joseph from a town called Arimathea went and approached Pilate, the Roman governor, and asked for special permission to take Jesus' body down off the cross. Now, once the Roman governor verified that Jesus was dead, he goes, sure, you can have the body. Who cares? Oh, the world's going to care, Pilate. The whole world is going to care what happens to that body. Trust me. But Joseph of Arimathea took Jesus' body and hastily buried it in his own tomb. Now, the Bible tells us in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John a few things about Joseph of Arimathea, where he's from, the fact that he's a member of the ruling council of Jerusalem, the Sanhedrin, tells us that he's a good and an upright man and that he's a follower of Jesus. But don't miss this. The infinite, the infinite strokes of purity of God's word tells us not only all those things about Joseph, but it also tells us what was in his bank account. Matthew tells us that Joseph was a rich dude. I point you back to Isaiah 53, verse 9. They made his grave with the wicked, those two men that were, had died beside him, but watch this, with a rich man he was buried in his death. This is how detailed God's word is about God's son. This is the apex story, guys. This story is better than all the other stories. But watch this. Paul says, but he was also raised on the third day in accordance with the Scripture. Now, this passage is right underneath it. It's not quite as clear, but look at what Isaiah 53 verse 10 says. It was the will of the Lord. Excuse me? What, what does that say? It was the will of the Lord, the Father, to crush him, Jesus, he has put on him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, then shall he see his offspring. He shall prolong his days, and the will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. And basically what that passage is saying is, is that the Father, in his plan of saving us, would move our punishment of our sin upon Jesus, right? But then there's this hope that the one Jesus would rise, that he would see the future, that his days would be prolonged, and that there would be prospering from the Father's hand. It's not quite as straightforward and clear, but Isaiah, hundreds of years, as Carl said, before Jesus was even born, lived out that passage, that chapter, Isaiah 53, perfectly. So when Paul is telling us that the, root, the resurrection is rooted and is grounded in Scripture, very specifically, and I could, there's hundreds of hundreds of other passages we could talk about. But there you go. 
That's one reason right there why I say that there's plenty of good reasons to believe that the resurrection happened. So one down, 553 to go. Here we go. Number two, the resurrection is rooted and grounded in history. Now, let's go ahead and rack up some numbers here. I love this part of the Bible because Paul is pointing fingers and he's naming names, right? He's going to say here, listen, I want you to understand that there were witnesses to this event. There were people who will testify to what I have just told you and what I'm about to tell you in the passages that we're not going to read tonight. They're going to be able to stand up and tell you with their life on the line that everything that Jesus said and that I have said and that I've said that Jesus did is true. And when they do, there's a good chance they'll be killed for that testimony. So nobody's going to lie about this event. Nobody's going to fib about this one because their life hangs in the balance. And so Paul starts talking. He says, listen, Jesus appeared to Cephas. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that amazing? Isn't that great? And some of you are wondering, who in the world is Cephas? Right? That sounds like a guy from Hickville, North Carolina, right? Cephas, you know, like Bo Cephas? Um, now, you know Cephas, you just know him by his other name. One of the most famous, if not the most famous disciple of them all, Peter. See, Peter, he had a lot of names. Simeon in the Hebrew, Simon, Peter, Simon Peter, and then Jesus' way of referring to Simon Peter. Cephas is the Aramaic word for rock. Some of you are remembering now uh, Matthew uh, chapter 16, where, where Jesus says, I tell you, your name is Cephas, and upon this Cephas, this rock, I will build my church. And so Paul says, he appears to Cephas. So boom, now we have doubled our reasons to believe. We're now at two whole reasons to believe, but Paul's not done. He goes, listen, then after that, he appears to the 12. Now let's do some math here. There's not technically 12 more unique men. Remember, unfortunately, Judas has fallen away, and he has killed himself. So there's only 11 of the 12. And since Peter was one of those 12, um, we're not really going to count him again. So there's only 10 more unique witnesses to the resurrection that Paul's talking about here, right? But don't let that freak out. Like, don't, like there's 12. Why don't we call them the 12 if there's not really 12 anymore? Well, listen. I don't know, some of us were alive in 1980 when John Lennon was killed. Um, but we didn't stop calling the other three Beatles the Beatles, right? We're going to call them the 12 because that's what we called them for years now, right? And so now we've got these 10 plus the other two. We've got 12 whole reasons why we think that the, that the story of Jesus, his resurrection is absolutely true. It's grounded in history. You can talk to these people right here. And then Paul swings for the fences. He goes, on top of that, Jesus appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time. More than 500 brothers. Can you just imagine that church service? Can you imagine, like, just watch? Now, we don't know exactly the event that Paul's talking about here. There's a number of options that we can choose from, all right there in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and even Acts. We don't know, but Paul says there's 500 dudes back down in Jerusalem. We could ask about this. More than 500 dudes. Now, you do the math. Now, we're in the hundreds of reasons to believe, right? And then Paul scales it back down again. He goes, let's just isolate it down. And I think one of the most surreal maybe even tender lines in the New Testament. He goes, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, he appeared to James. Now, maybe you don't understand the significance of that statement, so let me explain. James, there was a lot of Jameses in the New Testament, right? Jesus had a disciple named James, the, the brother of John, right? He actually had a couple disciples named James. But this James that Paul's talking about here is actually the brother of Jesus. And this James, like James's and Jesus' other brothers and sisters, half-brothers and half-sisters, if you will, when Jesus comes on the scene and he begins to make these great claims about his identity and he begins to make these great claims, these audacious statements about his kingdom, and who he is, and in relationship to his heavenly father, they get a little nervous, they get a little uncomfortable, and they're going, I think he's lost his mind. So let's just go get him and, quote, put him away. Now, now you look at that and you go, how dare they? Oh, hold on a second. Stop, stop. If your brother or your sister said the same things that Jesus said, you would be putting them in the loony bin as well, right? Seriously. 
They didn't want Jesus to get himself killed. They didn't want Jesus to get them killed. And so the best thing they could do was just like, let's just put him away. Let's just take him back home to Galilee, and we'll put him on the farm, and we'll give him his own little 40 acres in the back, and he'll be fine and keep him safe, okay? But Jesus goes to James. Can you imagine that moment, guys? Can you imagine that moment? when Jesus reveals himself to his brother James, who had said some harsh things to Jesus about Jesus. And it's like Eileen says, didn't come to condemn. I'm not back here with my pierced hands to condemn. I'm here to show you that I've saved you. So now the whole total is well over 500. Paul says he appeared to the apostles. He appeared to the apostles. Oh my gosh. How many apostles are we talking about? Well, the book of Acts says there's Barnabas, and then there's Silas, and then there's Andronicus, and then there's Junius, and then there's Barnabas, if I didn't already say him. All these uses, right? And, and, and we don't know, but I mean, right there on the day of Pentecost, there was 120 believers gathered there in the upper room when the Holy Spirit fell on them in Acts chapter 2. So can we just assume that there's, I mean, just a safe conservative estimate of like 40 apostles there? So now we are at the number of 553, and finally Paul says this. Oh, yeah. There was one more. Lastly, he appeared to one born untimely, me. Now, those of you who walked through the book of Acts with us for 29 weeks last year, you know that the story of the murdering Christian killer Saul going down from Jerusalem to Damascus and having this radical encounter with the risen Jesus that blinds Paul and knocks him to, his, to the ground. It changed not only Saul's name to Paul. It changed not only the direction and the vector and the words coming out of Paul's mouth. That moment, that meeting, that interruption on the road to Damascus went on to change the world, in the world in which we sit tonight. That's not an overstatement. And Paul says, he appeared lastly to one untimely born, a little guy, a nobody, me. And so, guys, you do the math, there's 554 reasons right here in these eight verses to believe that the story of the resurrection is absolutely true. But it begs another question. What about you? Has Jesus appeared to you? And so you're sitting here and you're thinking, 554, there's a whole lot more than that. You're right, by a factor of millions. I mean, we could have talked about Mary, because Jesus revealed himself to her, or the other Mary, because Jesus revealed himself to hers, or the other, other Mary, and Salome, and all the women, right? And all the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions of people since that moment who have met Jesus and had their lives changed. The question still remains, has he revealed himself to you? Has he come to you? If so, what are you doing with that? If you believe this story, what are you believing? What are you doing with that story? And if you don't believe the story, why not? Maybe you need just a little bit more prompting, maybe just a little more encouragement, maybe you just need a little, little gentle shove towards faith. Let me say it this way. The cross was Christ's payment but the empty tomb is your receipt. There you go. See, it was Jesus who died on the cross. And when we talk about the price that he pays, mm, I think you're going to think that it was the beating and the snatching out of his beard and the crown of thorns that they pressed or the spear that they shoved into his side or the, the spikes that they drove into his hands and feet. Stop, don't, no, no, you missed it. That's not the price that Christ paid. The true price that Christ paid was for the first time in all of eternity, watch this, for the first time in all of eternity, there was a separation between God the Father and God the Son because of your sin and my sin. That Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because we're all a bunch of sinners and our sin is upon him. Christ died, according to the scriptures, for our sin. So that's the price that Christ paid. But you have a little 
proof here. There is an empty tomb. There's, there's payment that's been made, and somebody's got the receipt. That's us. We're looking at that going, somebody paid, but it wasn't me. Somebody has settled up my tab, but I didn't take out my wallet. See, Jesus had to pay that price because you can't afford it. It doesn't cost you your bank account. It doesn't cost you your portfolio. It costs you your life. And Jesus says, I've got you. I came to seek and to save that which was lost. I love the world. I gave my life for it. I didn't come to condemn the world, but to save the world. Here's the proof. Now, I do love what my, my boy, Philip Yancey, says. He says, honestly, about the empty tomb, he goes, <laughs> goes, the empty tomb does not prove that Jesus is alive. The empty tomb proves that Jesus is not in the tomb. <laughs> but here's what you got to believe if you don't believe the story of Jesus' resurrection. Is that beginning back 4,000 years before Jesus was ever born, there's a conspiracy, a hoax, a myth, a lie that's held secret by hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people across thousands and thousands of years who could all do the same thing. Which, by the way, the richest and most powerful politicians on the planet today can't seem to do. So what's it going to be? Close with these questions. Do you believe the resurrection? And if so, what are you doing with it? If you don't believe the resurrection, why not? We've put a piece of paper on your seat and a pen, and I'm going to give you some instructions here, kind of just a look at this uh, set of uh, instructions up here. I'm going to give you this. Um, we're going to give you just the band's going to play kind of quietly here as we wrap up here in just a few moments. But this is what I'm going to ask you to do. You don't have to do this. You don't have to do this. But I would love it if you would do four things. I know there's three things on the screen, but I'd love it if you'd do four things. Number one, if, if you'd take and put your name on that piece of paper. Anywhere on it. I don't care if you orient it this way or this way. There's no wrong way. Just put your name on it. Uh, just so that we, we can... We can pray for you. I can follow what we do if you've got questions. Number two, tell us what you believe about the resurrection. And number three, tell us what you're going to do about it. Now, you could, that, that goes two different ways. You say, man, I believe Jesus is alive, and before I get home tonight, I'm going to tell somebody. All right, great. Sign that, Benny. Good, go. If you're sitting there, be honest. This ain't Sunday school class. I, I'm, not, I'm, I'm interested in the truth. If you're like, Pastor David, I just don't know, man. Then put down, Pastor David, I just don't know, man. You're asking me to believe a lot here. I've been to a lot of funerals. Never saw the dead guy get up once. Say that. Put that down. Let's talk. Let's have some barbecue. Let's pray together. Let's search the scriptures. Let's see if Jesus can't change your life as well. And then fourthly and lastly, Bill will tell you in the middle of this final song that we're going to sing in league right now, if you would, just come. Whenever you're done, whenever you're done writing out the answers to those three questions and put it in this box right here, just privately. And it's whenever, don't matter if you're first. If you're done now, you can come now. If you finish while we're playing and singing the song, come then. But just don't miss this opportunity. Let me pray for you.